be not on me, but on Jesus Christ. So, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can come together and lift you up. Your word says to cast all of our burdens on you, that you care for us and you love us. And thank you that we can come together and rejoice in that, your love and your mercy, and that you set us free. And, and we pray that everything that goes on here this morning, that you would be pleased and glorified in all that. Worship, prayer time, the word. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on.
Listen to my prayer, O oh God. Don't ignore my plea. Hear me, Lord, and answer me. For I am distraught. Hear, O oh Lord, and answer me.
since since then since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus the son of God let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and, and find grace to help in time of need. Lord, we draw near to you because you invite us to draw near to you. We do not come in our own merit, we come in yours. We can only come only by your grace provided through the cross. We give thanks for the abundance of your mercy, your kindness, your patience. You are so good, Lord. We'll take time to just seek the Lord, to spend some time to worship him, allow his Holy Spirit to speak into your heart. And uh, just wait on him.
Thank you so much for the time we've had where we can come and sing and we get our minds off of the things that so easily distract and come before your throne in praise. Lord, thank you that we can bring our requests before you, the sovereign God of the universe. You rule and reign. You know all and you are good. What a blessing. God, give us ears to hear now as we talk about your word. We talk about this word worship today. Lord, may you enlighten our hearts and our minds, quicken us in our spirits, and we could live a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called. Thank you that you love us. We give you praise. Amen. The scriptures present a picture from table of contents to maps of a sovereign God. He rules and he reigns. And while there's many pretenders out there, there's only one true God, and He is the God. And in the beginning of our book, it starts out and just states a statement of fact, in the beginning, God. He was there, is there, and He created. He reveals Himself in the very early parts of our book as a triune being needing nothing. He didn't have to create us. He didn't need a thing, and yet he did. He loves us. And the universe is spoken into existence by the word of his power. We know Jesus is revealed as the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And we know that the spirit was hovering over the face of the deep. We see all of this in the very early pages of our book. He creates by a word and worlds appear. Earth is the focal point, it seems, of his creation, at least what's revealed to us. And it gives insight into how everything started. The curious want to know, how did it all begin? No matter how far back we trace things, there must be a first cause, as they talk about. There's got to be something at the beginning, and beginnings matter. They matter deeply. Because when you push everything back to the, to, to the very beginning, you're going to come up with one of two conclusions. You're either going to come up with in the beginning was God, or you're going to come up with in the beginning was eternal dust of some sort. And through this magic thing of time, this dust bangs together or something, and, and because we spread it out over billions and millions and trillions of years, all of a sudden life comes forth. It takes far more faith to believe in that than it does to believe that in the beginning was God who is life and He spoke and life came forth. I accept the Genesis statement. I believe that it is true. So much more than this. <laughs> and the reason that this exists is because of this. It is as appointed unto men to die. <laughs> They're going to die once. And after that comes judgment. If there is a creator, then there is a responsibility of the created to that creator. If I am just a random accident and chance, there is no, it doesn't matter what I do. But if there is a time where I am going to stand before the one who created and give an account of what I have done with what I have been given, I don't like that. I don't want that. And so I need to get rid of him. And so I'll come up with something as crazy as in the beginning was dust. And dust started spinning somehow. And when it crashed together and we add billions of years to it, life comes out of that. Well, I, I'm sorry. I don't buy it. There's going to come a time when you and I are going to stand before the Lord and give a defense. Are you ready? Are you ready to give that defense? Because it's listed right here, the only defense that's going to matter. Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting Him. My righteousness, my justification, my ability to stand before the Creator of all is not me, it's Him. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And that Creator God <laughs> laid down Rules, things that he wanted to be followed, laws, commandments, the way things are supposed to work. The God who speaks did. He not only created, he commanded. 
that things be done. That his words, his deeds, his instructions be recorded and given to us. He supernaturally preserved those things down through the millennium, millennia to get to us today. Phenomenal study. Uh, it's beyond what I want to talk about today, but what a great study for us to do is to figure out how we've got the Word of God in our midst. I would challenge every parent in here to make sure that your children understand how we have the Word of God and why we can believe it. Why it is the most well-documented ancient document in history and in the world. Right. I mean, under, you will run into, as you step out of your world and into your homes, you're going to run into people who say, well, the Bible is just full of contradictions and who can believe that book? You better have an answer. My standard answer to that is when people, well, the Bible's full of contradictions. I go, really? It's full of them? Well, give me five or ten. I mean, obviously, it's full of them. Why don't you just rattle off a few to me and we can talk about it? Well, I, you know, I've never actually read it. I just heard that. Okay. Well, then I know where that argument's coming from. What is revealed in our Bibles, and I, again, I would encourage you to undergo that study, is that we also have an enemy. Remember, we just covered this in Ephesians, right? We went through it, and we have a foe, we have an enemy, and what that enemy wants is he wants to steal God's worship. He wants what's entitled and intended for God, he wants. How do you know that, Click? Well, I know what he tempted Jesus with. You remember the temptations? You know, bread and, and God will take care of you, so throw yourself off the, off the roof or the temple mount. And he says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, it ain't happening. There's only one God and you're not Him. There's only one worthy of worship and you're not Him. God and God alone is worthy of all worship. Be gone from me. So you move along a little bit. Jesus is traveling. We know the story. He was sitting at the well. A woman from Samaria comes out. He starts saying, will you give me a drink of water? Why are you talking to me? You know, Go call your husband. You know, have a, you know, I don't have a husband. That's right. You've had five of them. And he goes through this whole thing with her, and she starts this religious discussion with him. Well, our fathers say, you Jews say this, and he says that, and he cuts right to the middle of it, right to the heart of it. And he says, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. He cuts through all of the stuff. And all of the noise, and he says, this is what my father is seeking. These are the type of people my father is speaking. The sovereign, triune, created, creator God who rules and reigns is seeking something. I don't know what happens to you when you hear that or when you read that. For me, I start thinking, wow, God is seeking something. And it's clear what he's seeking, and a whole flood of questions come into my mind. I don't know if they do you, but they all, it's the way I work, I guess. But my first question is, what is worship, and how do we do it? If my father is seeking that, what is worship, and how do I do it? Yeah. Because after all, my father's seeking that true worshipers, yeah. and he wants it in spirit and truth. What in the world does that mean, Lord? What does that mean? I want to learn what that means, what it means to worship in spirit and truth. And I want to know, are there examples given in the scripture of what worship is? Because that's how we define things, isn't it? The Bible is our book. You've preserved your word down through the centuries for us. You've given us examples. I want to know how it works. Are there examples in the scripture of people worshiping? And can I do it wrong? Maybe it's my negative nature. I'd be negative blood, so I'm commanded to be negative. But can I worship wrongly? You said he wanted worship in spirit and truth. That must mean that, that, that he could do it wrong. And you must say that if there's true worshipers, then there must be false worshipers. Right. God, I don't want to do that. I want to be a true worshiper. Yeah. Yeah. These are just a few questions that flooded into my mind as I read that passage. And the only way I know how to figure out these things is to do kind of a word study on what worship is and start answering some of these questions. In the Greek language, when you read this word, the Father is seeking those to worship Him. That word is proskunihu, to kiss the ground, prostrating before a superior. To 
kiss the ground. In Hebrew, it's shakaha. They always yell in Hebrew. You know, it has real harsh shakaha. Sounds like something else. To bow down, pay homage before a monarch and before God, the emphasis of absoluteness is added. So Greek, we have kiss the ground, prostrating before a superior. Hebrew, we have to bow down, pay homage before a monarch, before God, and when God is involved, it's the absoluteness of it, where we fall before God. You can see right off the bat here that worship has very little to do with music and everything to do with knowing who it is we are worshiping. (laughs) We're bowing and kissing the ground and the feet of the one that we are worshiping. The word doesn't exclude music, but that's not the point of this word. That's not the way it's defined. Think about it this way. In Greek and Hebrew, as well as in English, there are many words that that are given and then they are expanded. For example, like drive. You know, we understand drive. We understand the concept. It can be hitting a ball. It could be driving down the road. It has multiple meetings, but drive. It's also in the word driven and driveway. Different words, you know, same root word, different meanings as you expand it out. Teach, teacher, teaching, old, older, oldest, you know. There's, there's dozens of them or hundreds of them or whatever. And you've got to look at those words and figure out, okay, what is being said? Worshiping, worshiper, worship, Old Testament, New Testament. We've got to understand what the words mean. Because I think we are a little bit mistaken in how we explain the concept of worship. We have limited it to a time of singing. That's not the biblical definition of worship. It's part of it. There's praise, of course. But the way you figure out what the biblical definition is, you a lot of times, at least you're trained to do it this way, or should be, is you go back and figure out how was it used in the Scripture and where was it used first in the Scripture? First occurrence, first reference. It's a good technique to figure out, okay, when God introduced this into the Bible, what, what, what was going on? How did he give us this word? Because obviously worship is important. And you'll find the first time that this word is used in the Old Testament is in Genesis 18.2. We know the story, the angels with the pre-incarnate Christ, most likely. The three of them are coming. Abraham sees them from a way off. He runs out and he bows down. He worships himself to the earth. <laughs> Come into my tent, my Lord, let me entertain you, or whatever. He bows down before these honored guests. He is humbling himself down on his face in the dirt before these people. That's the first occurrence of the word worship, the the, the Hebrew root word that makes up worship. It's a bowing down, a prostrating yourself before someone. The first time the actual word worship is used is just a little bit later, and it's shocking to me. (laughs) Many write regarding Abraham's test and trial, which is all good and all right. I prefer to look at this as a worship model presented by Abraham. (laughs) Of all the terms Abraham could have used, this is not one that as a 21st century American I would pick. You know what's going on here, right? I mean, some of you are familiar with the story enough. Is that God tells Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. I'm going to bring so many people out of you. It's like the stars or the sand, and you're not even going to be able to figure it out, buddy. There's going to be so many. And finally, when he's really old, he has Isaac. Remember, what is he, 100 years old when Isaac comes around? And Isaac's growing up, and God comes to him and says, I tell you what I want you to do. As I want you to take your son, your only son, the heir of the promise that I have given to you, and I want you to take him and offer him as a sacrifice to me. What? And we know what Abraham does. He gets up the next day. I doubt if he tells Sarah, but he gets up the next day. He takes Isaac, and, and he starts on his journey. And a couple days later, or three days later, he sees the mountain, and he tells the servants, stay put. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship. Are you kidding me? I and the boy will go over there and worship. And come, come to you again. He was going to take the air of all the promises that God had given him. 
And he's going to take them, and he's going to bind them up, and he's going to lay them on a wood pile, and he's going to slit his throat. And then he's going to set it on fire. (laughs) I and the lad are going to go worship. First usage. Hmm. No wonder Abraham's called the father of faith, right? Because he even says, we'll come back to you. That's faith. He knows what he's going to do. We know how the story turns out, right? Abraham does not. He is walking in obedience to God, who has just asked him to give up absolutely everything. And he says, I'm going to go worship. (laughs) I need my mind renewed. And what's often overlooked here is Isaac's no slouch either in this. He's at least a teenager. Many people think he's 30. So you got a a hundred and something year old man with a teenager or a young adult, and he's saying, Son, let's go worship. I don't know about you, but if Isaac wanted to get away, I believe he could have. What are you nuts? I mean, he does ask, hey, Dad, I see the, you know, the fire and I see the wood and the ropes and the knife. Uh, where's the sacrifice? Abraham says God will provide. At some point in time, they put the wood down, they set the knife down, they set the torch down, and he ties him up. And Isaac gets on the altar. That's faith. We are going to go worship God. <laughs> Wow. Bowing before a sovereign God, kissing the dirt, (laughs) laying before God and saying, your will be done. No matter what, I will follow you. All that you have commanded me, all that you have promised me, I lay down at your feet. I will worship you. That's the first time it's used. What's God seeking? (laughs) Father is seeking those of us who would worship Him in spirit and truth. How sold out are we to God? Do we have Abraham-level faith? Do you have dreams? Do you have visions? Do you have desires? Do you have goals? Are you willing to lay them down on the altar of God in worship? Before you, God, I lay everything down. Are we there? The Father is seeking worshipers like that. I often say I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet. I'm actually the son of an accountant. But I'm going to tell you what's coming. I'm going to tell you what's coming, and it's coming quicker than any of us would like to imagine it. Is there is coming a time, and it's not far off, where you and I are facing the enemy in a darkness that is getting worse and worse and worse. It is getting dark. Openly satanic worship services on TV. Open perversion that was labeled as mental insanity for 2,000 years is now idolized and presented as normal. And if you don't accept it, if you don't endorse it, you're in trouble. You are in trouble. There is a refining coming to the church in the West. It is coming, and it's coming quickly. Where are we? Where are we at? What, what, are we willing to lose our jobs, our houses, our cars, our entertainments, our life for the gospel? Well, that could never happen here. Are you kidding me? If you're even barely aware of what's going on in the world, it's coming like a steamroller. It's already illegal in some countries to preach the gospel. It's already that we need to get rid of the Bible because it's full of hate speech. You don't think that's coming? It's coming. And short of God's mercy, where millions and millions and millions of people get saved in a, in a, in a, in a major Reformation type of revival, the church is headed for trouble. Not really, though. Not if we are true worshipers. We fall before our Father and say, Your will be done, not my will. God, you can take everything. You can have everything. I'll worship you in spirit and truth. I will not bow before the gods of this age or this world. Are you there? 
If you're not there, why are you not there? What is it going to take for you to get there? What's it going to take for us to get on our faces and kiss the feet of God? And say, not my will, your will be done. You could take everything. I'll still worship you. You know what the oldest book in the Bible is? Job. You know what happened to Job? Good old Job. Don't we love Job? I don't like reading Job. I'm sorry, I just don't. It's worse than Ezekiel in the end there with measuring the temple every year. You know, it's like, Job, Job is a problem for me. It's just a problem. Job didn't know what was going on. We do. We have the luxury of reading it. We've read it multiple times probably. And we know the end of the story. Job's walking through it. And he's sitting there just minding his own business, being a righteous man of God. And all of a sudden, boom, his world is destroyed. Kids taken. His wealth is taken. His reputation is trashed. Everything is gone in a moment. And Job gets, he gets so bitter and angry about his responses. I hate you, God. Wrong. wrong. Wake up if you just heard me say that. That's wrong. That's, this is what he did. <laughs> this is after they just come to him, one after another. Boom, boom, boom. Your kids are dead. Your property has been stolen. Everything is crashed and burned around you. Job gets up, shaves his head, and he fell on the ground and worshipped. <laughs> wow. What about you and I? What are we going to do? This is my introduction to the topic. I figured it was a good place to start. I mean, seriously, what are we going to do? If... Again, I want to just touch this again, and I want to challenge the parents in here to do this. Go back and study how we got our Bibles. It will encourage you immensely. Take the time necessary, because you will have to defend it. And if you don't understand, and if you don't, if you don't get it, and you can't explain it, you're going to be at a, at a handicapped position. You need to understand why the Word of God is accurate, true and why it makes common sense to believe in it do the study do the work put in the effort especially you young people you are going to be challenged i guarantee you when you step out into a job into school into the world that's one of the questions you're going to get you believe the bible how can you believe that book that's just some old religious book. there's lots of religious books there's a book of mormon and there's a quran how do you know which one to believe that book's all full of errors and contradictions you're going to hear all of that. A wise man prepares. Get prepared. Get prepared now while you still can. While Bibles are freely available, where I research books are still available, while the Internet still lets you even put in the word God. Get prepared now. That's my challenge. More to the topic of this, or at least tied into the topic of this, is how do you define the word worship? I've given you a couple different definitions for it. They're all the same. We bow on our face before a sovereign God. <laughs> You're God, I'm not. All of us get to that place sooner or later. I recommend sooner. So much easier. We can be humble ourselves or we can be humiliated. Humbling's better. <laughs> God's God, we're not. He's worthy of praise. Let's get on our face before him. Why is God seeking worshipers, and what does that mean? It's a good question to chew on as we end this today. What is God? He said God is seeking worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and truth. Why? I'll give you a little hint. I've already covered it. Is that He is sovereign, and He knows all. And when things come into our life, we will either choose to bow before Him as God, or we will fight tooth and nail with partial information. <laughs> He wants us to worship Him. God, you're sovereign, you're good, you're God. I worship you. I accept from your hand what's, what you're doing. Help me to walk in a way that's pleasing to you. I want to worship you, Lord. And I guess the last thing I'd ask is, how's your heart today? How is it? Is there anything in this world that you can't lose or let go of? that has control over you, 
that you won't lay on the altar? Most of us are there in one way or another. God, I will serve you, but don't make me do this. Don't touch this. Leave that alone. (laughs) I mean, whether we admit it or not, we all have that kind of stuff. God's seeking true worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and truth. And if it comes down to it, to where we lose everything, will we worship Him? Or will, like so many, we walk away from our faith? Well, God's not good. He's not loving. He's not this, that, and the other. How could a good God let this happen? How could a righteous, holy God not stop this evil that came into my life? How many times have we heard that? God was really love, he'd do this, as if we know what God should or could do. It's coming to us, each one of us. Maybe not as dramatically as I'm laying it out, but it may. It certainly has throughout church history. What makes us think we're going to get a pass? Will we live for the Lord? Will we lay everything down at his feet? Were we willing to die for our faith? Or is this just something we do? Because I think there's going to be a delineation made where we stand for the truth, we stand for God, we're willing to lay down our lives and those that aren't. There has to be. The Scripture says it's coming. Where are we? Where are you? Is the most important question. I think it's worth thinking about. Father, thank you for the word of God. If you're getting baptized, you can go on up and get changed and ready. I'll meet you up there in the tank. Father, thank you for the word of God that you have given to us. You have preserved it down through the centuries for us. You want us to worship you. Thank you for that. Lord, may we be people who are immersed in the word, that we make time in our lives for the word of God, that you could speak to us. Or that your spirit would have material to draw from in our hearts and our minds and that we would know the truth and that we would walk in it and that we would live a life that's pleasing to you as we seek to honor you in everything. God, thank you that you revealed yourself to us. You certainly didn't have to and I'm so grateful you did. And our response should be worshiping you, laying it all down. So God, help us. Help us, Lord. Lord, help us to be those that you are seeking, that we would be one of those that worship you in spirit and truth. And Lord, I know this is just an introduction. It doesn't cover the whole thing. I understand that, but it's a foundational stone we must have. Will we lay everything down before the sovereign God of the universe and say, your will be done, thy way, not my way. God, have your way. May we bow before your feet and worship you. I thank you so much that you love us exactly where we are. You love us and you want to take us further. And I thank you for that, that you're not finished with us yet. You're still working on each one of us. And I thank you for that truth as well. If there's somebody here, somebody listening to this that doesn't know you, hasn't taken that first step, God, I pray they would start today. We're going to bow before somebody. We're either going to serve the devil, we're going to serve the Lord, we're going to serve ourselves. God, help us to serve you, to love you, to bow before you. Cry out to God. Find freedom and forgiveness and new life, purpose. That you can make it to that wedding feast, that time where we rejoice together with the bride. God, help us. Don't let anybody waste another moment of our lives. They're, they're just, we're not guaranteed another second. But may we choose wisely. May we walk with you all the moments we have. So, Lord, take all this today, the singing, the prayer, the the message, Lord, the baptism we're going to have, Lord, the fellowship that's going to come after it, and Lord, may you be glorified, may your kingdom be furthered. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.